Few writers have the literary and intellectual accomplishments of our next guest. Martin Amos is the author of 14 novels, two collections of stories, six nonfiction books, and a memoir. His newest collection is The Rub of Time, Bello Nabokov, Hitchens, Travolta, Trump, Essays and Reportage, 1994 to 2017. And we're happy to welcome him back for the second half of the conversation we began last night. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Um, so when you write for various publications, do you pitch the ideas or are they pitched to you by the editors? A <coughs> um, bit of both. Uh, I, I sometimes use journalism as a way into a field that I want to write about in fiction. So I, in one of my novels, there's uh, an imaginary, well, not so, not implausible British royal family. Um, and to prepare for that, I wrote a long piece for The New Yorker about, a long book review about uh, various ro books about the royals, mm -hmm. something I'm not that interested in. Um, just to get the knowledge. And when I wrote about pornography in another novel, I suggested to Tina Brown, in fact, mm -hmm. that I should, she should send me to California and I would hang out. And that is included in this collection. Yeah. Um, what was that experience like? Um, well, it was sort of, it was quite funny, um, especially because um, pornography, as well as being a misogynistic form, is an utterly humorless form. You know, one, one burst of laughter and the whole thing collapses. The mood's killed, in a way. Y yeah. Um, and um, I had the luck to meet a, a, a woman porn star who was um, highly intelligent and humorous. And she... She took me under her wing and, and introduced me to people and told me these startling truths about the, the industry. And um, it was very enlightening. Um, depressing in a way, but, uh, but there it was. There, it was just, it was in the year 2000, in the year 2000, and it was just becoming uh, industrial-sized industry. Mm -hmm. um, before online? Yeah, mm -hmm. before it had found its natural home, which is, of course, the internet, mm -hmm. and uh, perfect for the internet. And you don't have to go and hang out in some murky store to get the material. It's mm -hmm. anonymous and it's free. I mean, I agree with my father in, that, in saying that serious sex, uh, fulfill, fulfilling sex, positive sex, is an artistic desert. Uh, no one's ever written well about it. Uh, hundreds of writers have written excruciatingly badly about it, um, men and women included. Um, uh, we can't do it. And the reason is that it, it, it's de-universalizing. No, fiction aspires to the universal. And as soon as you start talking about sex, it's like talking about dreams. Um, you, you enter a land of the, what Freud called the polymorphous perverse. It's all quirks and urges, and, um, and it's not shared by other people. It's, it's, very, it's all your own. And we've, we've all had that dream of uh, taking an exam, a public examination in the nude with a pen that doesn't work. I mean, we've all had that one, mm -hmm. but that's about the only dream that is universal. Uh, as Henry James said, tell a dream, lose a reader. Uh, lose all, every reader. Um, it, there are few successes with dreams in, in literature and some stunning successes with dreams. But, um, and Kafka, for instance, is all about dreams. But it, and Joyce, Finnegan's Wake, is all about dreams. And um, if you try to do it at any length, it's... it's uh, a torment for the reader. And the same with sex. Um, you can do comical sex. That, that's not a desert, but um, the rest is. And th that was, you know, it used to be simply illegal to write about sex. Um, that, that applied from the first novel, 1600 and something, 
uh, Don Quixote, early 17th century, right up until 1963, when the ban on Lady Chatterley was lifted, D.H. Lawrence. And you imagine that once that ban was lifted, uh, all the writers in the world thought, right, we can write about sex now. And they all did. Um, and no one was any good at it. Uh, it was unforgettably and definitively parodied in one sentence by Kurt Vonnegut, who picks up a sort of hot magazine and turns to a short story in it. And it said, she, she gave out a cry, half, half pain, half pleasure, brackets, how do you figure a woman, close brackets, as I rammed the old Avenger home. I mean, that more or less says it all. I mean, it's just transparently insecure and boastful and uh, vulgar and, and basically indecorous, you know, just not what you want to read. If you went into a, a bar and got talking to some people, if they were all talking about sex, their sex lives or their dreams, you'd go somewhere else, wouldn't you, very quickly. And the same applies to, to the novel. I well, mean, I mean, speaking of uh, somebody who was part of a lot of people's dreams, I mean, this is an awful segue, but <laughs> John Travolta, who at one point was, you know, um, one of the biggest stars, and then he disappeared. And you wrote a profile on him, and you said that Travolta made things terribly difficult for you. How did he do that? Oh, just by being so agreeable and accommodating and making such an effort and being a nice guy and being an intelligent guy, although slight point misser. And that's why his career having, you know, he was the biggest star on earth for a while. And then he, then he made a series of terrible films and became a uh, a forgotten, half-forgotten figure, and then came surging back with Pulp Fiction, uh, and then sort of got it wrong again, and is now more or less obscure. I mean, he couldn't recognize a good part, uh, a good role for him. Why was that? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it was a basic incapacity. He turned down lots of good films. But why was that a bad experience for you? Because most people would say, you know, um, when you meet people that everybody likes and they turn out to be jerks and... Oh, no, you know. I mean, I, I was being sort of playful, really, because um, he had made it very easy for me and he'd given me a... You know, I was on the set of Get Shorty, that Elmore Leonard novel that was made into a good film. Um, and, no, everything was... fell into my hands. Um, but it... but... Usually, the, the writer of a profile is much happier if, if the object, if the, if the subject of the profile is, is a jerk and uh, a bore and rude and, you know, that's easy to write about. When they're nice, it's, it's, uh, that's a, a, it haunts all writing that, as Montemont said, you know, happiness, niceness, goodness, writes white. It's the opposite qualities that really show up on the page. The darkness. Yeah. Well, you've spent the better part of your adult life living in the United States. As an observer, um, have you found American exceptionalism to be real? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, well, obvious dig, but uh, exceptionally perverse and uh, pig-headed. Um, and. In what ways? Well, I knew all about all this, and I, um, fr you know, very frequent traveler to America and spent chunks of time in America. But when you come to live, you soak it up in a different kind of way. And after seven years in Brooklyn and Manhattan, there are things I find completely infuriating and, and crazy-making about living in America. Uh, Such as? Well, the, th the three main ones, um, the two main ones are race um, and what a convulsion we've had in the, in the last nine years. The first black president, two-term president, successful presidency, um, and followed by this incredible backlash. Um, you know, the Tea Party, the right-wing nutters um, 
that, that wing of the Republican Party was formed on the day after the, the inauguration of Obama. Mitch McConnell saying, our aim is to make this a one-term administration in which they failed. Um, and obvious racial hostility um, that I, I, I've come to despair about race in America. Um, I, don't, I don't see a way out of it because I can imagine uh, I can imagine the black population getting over it in you know half a century, another half if if certain institutional biases are abolished, it's conceivable that they'll get over it. It's not conceivable that the whites will get over it. When you're responsible for three and a half centuries of real cruelty, cruelty that, that doubles down on itself every day, every year, every decade, uh, and you have a civil war that, uh, where you feel so strongly about this issue that there are 750,000 fratricides uh, 300,000, 50,000 Southerners gave up their lives because they felt so strongly about slavery uh, as the natural way things should be. Then, after that, the South behaved as if it had won the Civil War. And you had Jim Crow and you had segregation, separate and unequal. Um, you starved the schools, the black schools of money in every way you could possibly torture the black population. That lasted another century. Then you had the civil rights movement and a time of hope and progress. Then you had the war on drugs and mass incarceration. Um, and now you have a, 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 a sort of joke uh, white supremacist in the White House. You call him a white supremacist? Oh, he's certainly that. Well, he's, oh, he's prepared to pretend to be that. He hasn't got a principle or a scruple in his entire frame. He used to be pro-choice on abortion. Um, scrap that. Um, he used to be not notably racist in any way. He scrapped that. He, he, he has this rather frail base of um, people who strongly approve of him. And he throws red meat to them whenever things are when there isn't a really pressing scandal about his own administration, he, he'll give them something along those lines. You wrote about Trump um, before he became president. Before he, just as he was getting the nomination. What, what did you see that others didn't see? I'm, I'm not sure I did, but I, in the first paragraph I wrote about Trump. I because you were talking about his cognitive de decline. Way yeah, and his, and his sanity. Um, if you look at early tapes of Trump on Charlie Rose and so on, it's a completely different person. It's, um, it's someone with a, with a much greater vocabulary than he's shown uh, in office and, and someone with a bit of reserve, ironical reserve that he hasn't got any more. And, and someone capable of, of saying something neat and funny, all that's gone. Um, he is, he's but a yet a lot of Americans uh, voted for him. Yeah. Well, I think the process there is that, I mean, I think part of Me Too is, is, is the movement Me Too is, is bad conscience from a large section of American women voters. You know, 53% of white women with uh, college degrees voted for Trump. I mean, uh, for this obvious raging misogynist who is now, who after a year in office, is endangering millions of women all over the world. Um, what do you think that was in response to? The vote for Trump? Yes. Well, I, they say Republican voters, women voters, vote for their husband's paycheck, um, imagining that Trump was going to, this completely feckless, uh, plutocrat was going to, you know, was of the common people, that he's speaking for the, you know, forgotten population of America. I mean, which is pretty delusive in itself. But to go for a, to go for a misogynist when and a molester, 
um, when on the other side is a highly intelligent, well-qualified woman feminist. It's a, it's a deeply visceral response to the candidate, not to what they stand for so much. Um, and you spent a lot of great, uh, a lot of time following American politics. Um, when writing about the Republican Party race, you point out that America still hasn't been able to figure out whether the presidency should go to the most intellectually able candidate or the most normative, meaning like, unexceptional, mediocre. Um, why do Americans wrestle with that? I know because the, um, do, do you lead with your gut or with your brain? Mm -hmm. And elsewhere on the planet. The judgment was in a long time ago that you go with the brain, but it still splits America down the middle. Um, they, it's a sort of it's a strong streak of philistinism of uh, distrusting the intellect, and you see the, the majority of Republicans think that universities are a bad thing. They 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 have a deleterious effect on society. Universities. It's the revolt against knowledge and the embrace of stupidity. I, I think it, it, I find it very hard to resist the conclusion that, that something, that there is a stupefying force at work. And um, the internet is also contributing to that? Internet. <laughs> well, don't you think it's the main candidate, the obvious candidate? What has happened in the last 18 years that has made people vote against their own interests? as they did in Britain. I mean, the big difference between Brexit, which is shameful enough, and Trump, which is much more shameful, is that um, no one in Britain knew what Brexit would look like. If they'd known that, Bre that Brexit had orange skin and yellow hair and, and couldn't uh, complete a declarative sentence but without, you had without eight, eight repetitions, um, Trump is a sort of like huge Jimmy Savile. Um, if they'd known that about it, okay. they wouldn't have voted for it. But um, Americans knew all about Trump. They'd had nothing but Trump for 18 months on their TV, and they voted for him anyway, um, with obviously disastrous results. I mean. But what about England, though? Um, Nigel well, Farage. England, like England doesn't matter except in England mm -hmm. and a bit in Europe. But it, 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 what happens in America affects the whole world. Now, this collection of essays is over uh, two decades. Um, in the past 20 years, is there anything that you've changed your position on that you have in here? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a great follower of uh, Maynard Keynes, who said, uh, when accused of inconsistency, or it would be now called flip-flopping, saying, when the facts change, I change my opinion. What do you do, sir, was his reply. To that. Um, of course you change your opinion as the facts change. Um, I, I can't think of, I'm sure there are several points that I would back away from now or hedge or qualify. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I'm very open to the idea of changing one's mind. Um, I'd like to read something from your uh, collection. It's kind of intimidating reading your words to you, but here we go. History is accelerating, and so with every passing day, the future becomes more and more unknowable. Our among our foremost thinkers, we find only one presentiment that is universally shared. This turns out to be a sinister variation on the idea of convergence. Not the convergence of nations and polities, whereby the world's autocratic regimes would gradually align themselves with a democratic and contentedly globalized mainstream. This particular expectation, even neoconservatives now concede, was a triumphalist fantasy of the 1990s, that curious holiday from what Philip Roth has called the remorseless unforeseen. The convergence we have now come to anticipate is a convergence of international terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Does the future scare you? Um, yes, it doesn't scare me as much as um, my childhood scared me in that the situation then was much more dire, Cold War years. Um, what, uh, what I grew up with under the shadow of and under my desk at school in, in the post-war equivalent of uh, 
drills for school shootings uh, was uh, what was called central thermonuclear exchange between America and Russia. And as you perhaps too young even to remember talk of nuclear winter and in fact um, the, the extinction of the species. That was what was at stake when I was a child. And then in 1989, when the Soviet Union collapsed, I said to my sons, I'm so glad you won't live, have to go on living under this shadow as I did until 1989, uh, after Reagan and, and Gorbachev made this breakthrough. Um, and the Soviet Union collapsed within a year or two from there. Uh, and th then there was this odd decade when there was a holiday from real events. And America spent one of those years on O.J. Simpson and another of those years on Monica Lewinsky. That's how much time we had on our hands in, in America. And then 2001, it was um, terrorism, it was sudden jihadism, uh, political Islam was the new enemy, but that wasn't, when they could talk about clash of civilizations, that's rubbish. It's uh, a clash between one civilization and a lot of s uh, supposedly religious gangsters. It didn't threaten uh, civilization. There was always the possibility of a rogue weapon, but a rogue weapon is nothing compared to, uh, you know, a mass exchange arsenal clearing exchange. In the 1980s, there was, there was enough firepower, nuclear firepower, to, to wipe out the world several times over. Um, but now we have we, the era of mutual assured destruction, which was the Cold War doctrine, meaning I can, I can destroy you, you can destroy me, so let's not get into trouble, let's not have any flashpoints. And it worked just about. I mean, it, we survived it. Uh, now it's, it's uh, we then entered the phase of the age of nuclear proliferation um, with Iran hoping for a weapon, Pakistan acquiring a weapon, India, and now North Korea. And if, if things, and possibly Iran, if things go wrong between um, the Korean leadership and, uh, and the American leadership, those two very frail characters, um, the fat kid who runs North Korea, as John McCain called him, and, and the fat coot who runs America, uh, both very neurotic and not really very much in touch with reality, then we could lose a city. Um, because they can now reach America maybe w within the year uh, with a nuclear weapon. Uh, and then America would completely destroy uh, North Korea and would make itself a pariah for at least a century. I mean, anyone who uses a nuclear weapon now will be ostracized by the rest of the planet for at least 100 years and will die a little death itself because it, it will be completely cut off from the rest of the, of the world. But that, that isn't a, a nuclear winter, that isn't global extinction. So I, I don't, of course, you'd have to be crazy not to fear for what might happen. And it is, Philip Roth was right, there's something about the way history works that makes it always unforeseen. Um, but it's not the end of everything. So I, I feel more cheerful than I did when I was a schoolboy or uh, indeed a sort of a 45 year old uh, when I became a father, when I had by then three children. Um, so I'm, I'm not wishful, I'm not, um, there, there are too many things that could go wrong and I, um, climate change is, is already booked into being a, a, a great and manifold disaster. And also something that will be so costly to deal with that you wonder 
whether governments can will be able to survive, whether um, you know, Lovelock, James Lovelock, the, the great prophet of all this, said that he sees the world devolving into religious gangs, um, that, that the center cannot hold, that um, these, these natural disasters that we've accelerated will be so ruinous that the government just won't have enough money to be able to, to restore and, and maintain a civilized, civilized surface to um, develop societies, and that it, it will all break down. I mean, that is, that, those are real possibilities, maybe several decades away. But I certainly think my, my children are going to... I mean, don't you feel about the weather that there are enormous forces up there? And um, don't you feel it's sort of uh, intuitively the case that We've heated the planet up, and you know, it's, the climate denier is a is a chump uh, of unimaginable p proportions. Um, it, it is going to happen. We can moderate it. We can't remove that that likelihood, uh, and that will put civilization under enormous strain. Thank you so much. I wish we had more time. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And thank you for giving us so much to think about. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.